a generation of two or three areas. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you for that warm Welcome. introduction. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you. We're very honored to have you here, President Reagan. Uh, this committee has met this morning. Uh, I'd like to go back a little over a year when you first formed this. I remember your comments very well. You said that this was one of the most important presidential committees you were establishing because of the urgency and priority of the area involved. And secondly, you indicated in one of your first days in office you had tested the system, but that you were sitting in the wrong chair and Vice President Bush was in kneecap. <laughs> I must tell you personally that uh, I think almost all of the members of this committee have been up in the kneecap. We flew out to Omaha. Some of us had a chance to sit in your chair even though they kept the telephone away from us. Uh, it was a good trip out. We spent a day with the Strategic Air Command uh, and through this, the committee has been very much involved in the work that's been undertaken. You will again receive through the Department of Defense and through Mr. McFarland uh, detailed written reports uh, very informally and very briefly. We'd like to tell you that we feel very confident that the two years in which the telecommunications structure in the United States of America has dramatically changed, that there has been no negative effect on the emergency communications of the country as provided by ATT and the common carriers and the operating companies in this country. We have recommended and there has been established a National Coordinating Center for Arlington, Virginia for the National Communication System uh, and that will be fully in effect permanently in March of 1985. We have undertaken satellite survivability studies which have already led to certain changes being made aboard the satellite to protect them from interference and from orbital change. We've undertaken major studies in automatic information processing and the relationship to the telecommunications industry. Uh, these studies, we hope, will continue on a major basis for the next year or so. Finally, we are now looking at the whole commercial survivability network as it applies for the United States. Uh, that network being outside the military network specifically, and are looking at making recommendations to the government, to the National Security Advisor, and to the Department of Defense, and all of the 22 other agencies involved with respect to funding priorities for the entire communications program. We thank you for your interest and for your attention. Well. Well, I thank you, <clears throat> Chairman Harris-Cog. It's good to see all of you again, have you here. Much has occurred since we last met in this room. Bud McFarland has kept me informed of the work that you're doing and of the considerable activity generated in the government in response to your input. You've been a vital stimulus in the area of national security, telecommunications planning, and capability enhancement. I want to take this opportunity to thank you as a group and to individually as well for the contribution that you're all making. Our nation is more secure and better because of what you're doing. The telecommunications expertise in this room is a powerful national security asset, and I regard the NSTAC and your willingness to serve as a model of private sector government cooperation. You're demonstrating what this kind of teamwork can accomplish while addressing issues of high national priority, and your task is crucial. Ensuring the capability of the nation's telecommunications assets, which the 30 corporations represented on the NSTAC largely compose, is vital to the national interest. I regard this challenge as a top administration priority. The nation's commercial telecommunications assets are key elements of our overall national security posture, and your guidance is a necessary part of the equation if our valuable communications assets are to effectively contribute to our nation's security. 
We continue to need your help, and I urge you all to stay personally involved. I'm pleased to announce that today I've signed a new executive order to streamline various agency assignments for national security and emergency preparedness telecommunications functions. It also establishes a more effective White House mechanism for coordinating telecommunications planning and formally creates the national communications system. The preparation of this executive order resulted from NSTAC's focus on government telecommunications planning. All of the national communications system entities, most of whom are represented here today, now have an important responsibility to address. I have designated the national communications system represented here today by Deputy Secretary Taft, General Powers, and the heads of several of its member departments and agencies as the vehicle for putting NSTAC recommendations in practice. It will also serve as the forum to coordinate government telecommunications planning in meeting national security leadership requirements. And I am pleased that a national coordinating center, which was a high-level NSTAC recommendation, is already in the first stage of operation. With your active participation, it is this, at this very moment, making a critical contribution to our telecommunications readiness. And I have directed the NCS to address your other recommendations with similar vigor. Government has to equal industry's performance in the NSTAC process, and I have asked all NCS member agencies to fully support this task. Today, we've reached a milestone. When the NSTAC was formed, I asked Rand Ariscog of ITT Corporation to serve as the first chairman. The progress we've made to date is a testimony to his leadership. And now, as we move into your second year, I'm pleased that Joe Sherrick of ComSat has agreed to serve as the NSTAC's new chairman. Ted Brophy of GTE will be serving as the new NSTAC Vice Chairman, so that we might appropriately recognize this changing of the mantle. I would like to ask Rand and Joe to join me here at the podium. I'm supposed to have some things here. <laughs> there. All right. Well, now that you are here, Rand, you have my personal thanks and the gratitude of the nation for the contribution you've made as the NSTAC's first chairman. Your leadership in forging a cooperative spirit enabled us to achieve our initial objectives and uh, get this operation on the way. And I'm very pleased that you will continue to serve as a member of the NSTAC. So on behalf of the American people, Along with your colleagues in the industry, I would like to present you with this symbol of the leadership that you provide. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, the uh, Joe, you're taking charge of the NSTAC with a number of vital issues still before us, and you will provide the kind of continuity that will guarantee NSTAC's further success. I look forward to working with you and the entire committee and meeting the challenges. Given your task, I'd like to present you with something that might be useful on the job. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. You know, I shouldn't do this, but I'm just tempted further with all of you and all that you've accomplished. But please tell me, in case I did it in a previous meeting or not, did I ever tell you about my first Sunday experience when I first came here with the communication system? I know that some of my people here have heard me. They'll have to put up with it again. Well, we were invited to the Virginia farm of Jack Kilpatrick, James J. Kilpatrick, the columnist, and for a Sunday lunch. So the helicopter landed in the South Lawn and Nancy and I got aboard and half hour later we're down there at his farm and he greets us and as we're walking toward the house he said, you know, your fellows have been here uh, for several days putting in the communications.
equipment and the phones. And I said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Well, he said, they said that it's a system that you can be in touch instantly with anybody, any place in the world. And I said, you mean to go a half an hour away from a lunch? <laughs> they got to put in a phone system? He said, yes. And he said, I challenged them on this being able to meet or get anyone in the world. And he said, they told me to name someone. Well, he said, I have a son who's on embassy guard in an embassy in Africa. And he said, they got him. And his mother got to talk to him and seen him for a long time. So then he said, I challenged him because I've got a son who's an enlisted man, a quartermaster on the USS Pratt with the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And he said, and then they told me they couldn't reach him. But he said, before I could say, I told you so, they said, the fleet is on maneuvers and only the president can reach the fleet. Well, we went on in the house and I met the young man's wife, very sweet young lady. And I remembered what he'd told me, so I excused myself, went back outside, and I said, is this right that I could get someone on the USS Pratt with the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean? He said, yes, and I said, get him. <laughs> so I went back in and got her. Well, she got to talk to her husband. She hadn't seen him for a long time, and I felt very pleased with myself until sometime later I got a letter from the young man. I hadn't thought about everything. For example, that the last part of that communication was going to be by radio to wherever the ship was. And he told me that on maneuvers, the air is full of traffic. Admirals talking to admirals, ships talking to ships. And then he said a voice came on and said, White House calling. And another voice said, what code is that? And a third voice said, wait a minute, maybe it is the White House. <laughs> And then he said they came down to a lowly quartermaster on a tin can there with the fleet. The air, he said, couldn't have been silenced faster by Hollywood than it was silenced. And he said, I got to talk to my wife. <laughs> of course, I hadn't thought about that the whole fleet would be listening in. <laughs> but he added this line, which I have treasured and remembered. He said, it was as if God had called the Vatican and asked to see an altar boy by name. <laughs> I just wanted you to have another slant on the importance of all that you, you are doing here. I won't abuse the system anymore. I've learned. <laughs> Thanks very much.